will be big comments. Uh, this one is a bit of a mystery still, where my first tweet is going to happen. Ken is fun, and Ken is a great um, friend to Barbie. I call it catching the F frame. I was this just this fat unit, you know what I mean, in a in a in a suit, and it was clear that I was not I was not the same as the others. So welcome everybody to a change of pace. Wonderful to be on the beach at Cannes for a Better Marketing podcast. And actually what's really lovely about this is that the engine of better marketing these days, um, and I'm sure Matt will forgive me, I would put Google. And you know, as we were just wow. saying, how things have shifted. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thank great you. That's, that's very, I mean, that's great praise coming from you. I'm not sure we're the engine. Well, I hope we're part of the engine at least. No, I think so. Well, we'll come on, we'll come on to less great praise later. <laughs> One of the things everybody's been talking about is, is the industry doing enough for sustainability? Where, where, what do you think? Well, the answer is no. no. I mean, I don't think anyone's doing enough on sustainability. I was at COP26 in Glasgow representing Google. And, you know, I came away more optimistic than I went in, probably because what I see is when governments, companies and communities work together, you can get real change. We saw that in the pandemic. And I think I saw for the first time at COP26, serious companies led by people who are really committed with real plans and you know the IPCC says we've got all the technology we need to confront the crisis we just need to deploy it and I've you know I've got a long history here I was on the board of the climate trust which is a big uh, the climate group which is a big um, charitable organization pushing for change here and so uh, I've been part of Google's journey as well so I think um, I'm proud of where we are as Google I'm really delighted that the industry has launched Ad Net Zero here in Cannes um, which is all about helping the advertising industry play its part, but there's a lot more to do. And in, in the ad net zero world, some of the metrics that are now going to be required, advertising emissions and uh, yeah. client transparency, how, how are you feeling about that? Have you had yeah. good conversations? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, at the macro level, um, there isn't a good set of metrics on sustainability that are approved across boardrooms. But what we know is that you know, being more sustainable is something that your customers want. We can see on Google, searches for sustainable goods and products have gone up by 5x in five years. So customers are voting with their feet. Your employees are going to require it and your shareholders are now demanding it. The question is exactly how you measure it. So I was in Davos, there are lots of good conversations there about getting to clearer measurement standards that help. But I think one of the big issues is, well, big companies can try and play our part. And you know, at Google, we were carbon neutral from 2007. We're the world's, one of the world's biggest purchasers of renewable energy, and we are well on the way to being carbon zero in our data centers. We've got five data centers that are over 90% carbon zero. So we're, we're playing our part, but there's a big challenge here, which is most of the emissions are in the supply chains. Yep. And those supply chains are made up of small businesses who often I find have the same intent as the large businesses, but don't have the tools. So one of the challenges is how do you help to go after what's called those scope three emissions in the supply chain. And I think that technology can play a part there. I can tell you more about that if it's useful. So yeah, do tell us more about technology because there's this balance between the human and technology yeah. and indeed yeah. nature, I'm sure, when you were in COP26, you yeah. would have seen what Prince well, Charles was up to. Yeah, so let's start, well, let's start with the human. Um, you know, as I say, Google searches for sustainable products and services are up. What we're doing in our products is, you may have used Google Flights for the first time in a while, uh, what you'll see is we use European Environment Agency data to show you um, the carbon impact of every seat in every cabin on every flight. So when you're choosing your flight on price and timing, you can also factor in that should you wish to. Eco-friendly routing on Google Maps is already saving uh, hundreds of thousands, the equivalent of 100,000 cars off the road through carbon emissions. And that will. So there's lots we can do in our products um, to help consumers make a difference because they want to. Uh, you know, when, when the trade-offs are right for them and make it easy for them to do that. On the sort of supply chain side, I think, you know, one of the things we've done that's interesting is we gave a million dollar grant to a small company called Normative and um, some engineering support. And what they do is they help small businesses to understand their own <coughs> carbon footprint. So they sort of, you enter your profile and you get through the carbon business calculator or the business carbon calculator, they get the branding right. Um, you can see um, a good approximation of your footprint and then you can start to manage it. And then what happens is the large company wants to get scope three emissions down and they can go to small companies who are using tools like that and be more certain that they're moving in the right direction. So it takes a real level of collaboration to make that happen. And, and what other lessons can Google teach the supply chain? Well, I think we've 
for, for many years worked hard on our supply chain. Let me just give you one very concrete example. You know, our data centers. Um, so as I, as I say, since 2007, we've been carbon neutral. We're well on the way to being carbon zero. We want every time you watch a video on YouTube or use um, Google Cloud or do a Google search, we want you to be confident you're not having a negative impact on the planet. Um, and one of the ways we've done that is really focusing on our data centers. So when I started at Google, we were offsetting. You know, that's fine, but actually it's a really poor solution for the long term. So then we really looked at how can we reduce the energy use in data centers and how can we make the energy that we do use come from renewables. So in 10 years up to 2017, we moved to become one of the world's biggest purchasers of renewable energy. And we've also found ways through uh, DeepMind, our sister company, um, to further optimize the cooling costs of data centers. So using machine learning, you look at patterns of demand and you look at what you can do with the existing ventilation and cooling systems. And because a machine learning is quite good at prediction, better than humans, and it can also alter those settings more deftly than humans can, we were able to achieve something like a 30% saving in our cooling costs on what were already some of the world's most efficient data centers. So hopefully there's some good examples there of how Fantastic. technology can really help. And now we share that technology with other people who run data centers. That's great. And, and moving um, to another theme of the week, diversity, equality, yeah. and inclusion. Yeah. And, and I think Google consider themselves leaders. I, I don't know what I should say. I haven't done enough research to validate whether that's true or not, but let's, let's go with it for a minute. I mean, I think... Uh, do you think you are? I, I think in all of these things, I hope we still have the humility to say, look, we've still got plenty of work to do, whether it's sustainability, diversity, representation, we've got a lot to do. But Lorraine Tuhul, our CMO, was here, and together we, will, we launched yesterday um, a, a, an addition to our inclusive marketing playbook, which is based on five years' work that her team's done on understanding how we're doing on how we represent people in our marketing material. And she can summarize better than me, but I think by looking in real detail at what we're doing, we realize so many areas for improvement. And if you want to have a look at it, google.com slash all hyphen in, all in is the place for some really good resources. But there are lots of nuances in there that we can just get so much better at. Disability is another one. We talked about that yesterday. Um, disability, we were representing people in wheelchairs and that was it. And actually, when you look at all types of disability, there's a billion people on the planet with some form of disability. Yeah. And so we've moved the needle. We now measure everything we do much better. We've moved the needle on representation, the center people represented, but also the variety represented so that people can see and recognize themselves. And, and what about when you look at your incoming um, hiring policies? How's that working? Are, are yeah. you representing well, no, the I mean, UK correctly, for instance? Uh, no, we've got a lot of work to do everywhere. Um, one of the things I'm proud that we did, you know, at Google, it's like, uh, in, God, you know, in God we trust, everyone else better bring data. And so we published our diversity data um, many years ago now, and it was poor. Right? The tech industry in particular, and our skew to engineering, yep. means that we're hiring from talent pools that were maybe 20 to 25% female, and our representation was not that much better. But once you start publishing, uh, it's a bit like gender pay reports in the UK and very similar things around the world. People start paying attention to how to improve those metrics. It's brutal, but it works. And so now we are you know, doing much better on women, particularly. I think uh, last year we had our best ever year for hiring women. It's over, nearly 38% on uh, the tech side of things. And representation's improving at all levels. And we're working hard in each country. And the constraints and the mix of what representation means are very different in each yeah. country, as we know as Europeans. Uh, so we're making progress, but there's a lot more to do. One of the other things we can do is the talent pools aren't big enough. Right. Um, and uh, we launched a program on digital skills training a few years ago, launched in Europe. We've now trained 70 million people around the world in digital skills. 50% of those people in Europe are women. It's different from the representation in the talent base. Now, it's a broader set of skills than just coding, things like analytics, online yep. marketing, and so on. But you start to see that this is for everyone if you approach it in, in the right way. So I'm optimistic, but impatient. And then I think I saw some of your data used about four or five years ago and that was looking at who had succeeded in Google and what kind of values did they need to have. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, and it was the soft skills completely that were coming top. Yeah. Is that still yeah. the case? Yeah, I think that you, what you're referring to there um, talks about psychological safety. And we were talking just before we started uh, this about creativity. And, you know, CAN is all about creativity in what you would call creative. But technology is all about creativity. We just call it innovation, yep. right? But it's the, it's the same thing. And you know 
through all of your vast experience and through your members' experience, that you need to create an environment of safety where experimentation is encouraged and rewarded and failure is not punished but celebrated. And I, I remember when I first started Google, we'd often get questions from journalists. Oh, you know, you had to shut down Google Plus. That's a real failure, isn't it? It was like, well, yes and no, right? So out of Google Plus came Google Photos, which is one of my yep. favorite products. We learned so much about collaborative working that we put into Google Docs and to Google Cloud. So I think, you know, if you're not failing at innovation in tech, you, you've got a problem. So here we are surrounded by advertisers. Obviously, the audience are mostly client side um, and the world has changed very fast from 2017 when yeah. I remember we called out rather violently that change needed to happen yeah. in, in the digital media space. Yeah. Um, and that was a lot to do with privacy not being respected, mm. metrics that were, I think I described them as dodgy metrics. Mm. Yeah. Um, and you have been founder members of GAM, yeah. for which we're grateful, but can you talk a little bit about that journey and, uh, yeah. and how you take because it was always intended to be feedback to the better things, not to be overly critical. No, um, so firstly, I am grateful for GARM because it's allowed us to work with the industry collaboratively on some of the things which we all need to um, have better standards on. So I think it's been a really welcome initiative. We were proud to be part of its foundation and we've gained a lot from it ourselves, but I think the industry has. Um, and you know, my view has always been we shouldn't wait for regulation we should do what is right. And when we screw up, we should put our hands up and say, we're sorry, you should expect better of us and we need to work with you. And I think, and I remember back to um, many years ago now when we had some issues with violent extremists using YouTube for radicalizing people. And um, we hadn't figured out how to spot and remove those videos, but we immediately apologized and said we'd work with the industry. And what we did was to um, identify working with 150 specialist organizations, how to classify you know, that kind of video. Developed a code of conduct with the EU, and we're talking about codes of conduct now within GARM, which is really important. This is around all content, not just advertising content. Code of conduct and policies, which we could then train humans in so that they could classify videos. Once we could do that robustly, we could use machines to classify videos. And now, and we publish our transparency reports on this, over 90% of the time, a video that violates that, posi po uh, that policy is not seen by a single human. So, you know, you can see that you can make progress by working in those ways. And I think GARM helps us to do that across the industry. Social media is obviously, there are significant challenges there. So I welcome that. I also welcome the collaboration that comes with going on that journey together. And also it's about building trust yeah, exactly. uh, as an industry. Yes, I do think, uh, I, I will give a shout out here for Ronan Harris in particular, who was very responsive at the time. Mm -hmm. um, not all platforms responded in the same way, I'll go yeah. with gracefully, and we're slow to kind of move. And there's still obviously some pretty big issues, some of the stuff happening with live streaming. You know, how are you feeling the journey is going? Are you making it more brand safe space? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I can't comment on social media, and I think you know, others have taken their time to come to the realization of what's needed. A few things are happening. You know, um, the regulators are rightly defining more clearly the standards. You know, it is for government to define what's legal and what's not legal. And I think uh, we see that in the UK with the online safety bill, in, in uh, Europe with uh, the Digital Services Act. These are helpful things that establish common standards for everyone. Um, I think we always need to do more. I mean, I'm responsible for Google's operations in Ukraine and Russia. And, you know, we've had to, um, I think a lot of our experience on YouTube has helped us in fighting misinformation. So we, we've taken down something like 92,000 videos and 6,000 channels in relation to misinformation, specifically about the Ukraine war. You know, tanks that appear to be rolling into your town, which are actually from 2014, yeah. acting very, very quickly to remove those. And at the same time, supporting quality content, because that's the other bit that we need to make sure that happens, is that quality content rises. So we have infrastructure called Project Shield, which we stand in front of 200 Ukrainian websites, press, government NGOs so that they can't be taken down by a DDoS attack, so they're rendered useless to a user. So things like that, which I'm really proud of. Equally, in Russia today, despite us closing our commercial operations and all the sanctions and having to go bankrupt because they seized all our funding, Russians can still access YouTube, carrying all of the video content from Western journalists. 90 million Russians uh, on YouTube. So we really want to play our part, not just in fighting misinformation, but also helping quality content to find users. At a time like this, it's more important than ever. It really is. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And then here we are, year and a bit away from the removal of cookies. <clears throat> You've got 65% of the search market. You know, what's that going to mean for yeah. digital marketing? What's it going to mean yeah. for 
humans again, because I'd, yeah. I'd love to kind of talk a little so, bit about I mean, I have to say, it's slightly old fashioned in describing what we do as a search market. If you think about how you research and buy purchases today, you're using sure. apps like Amazon, TripAdvisor and so on. Google has to work hard to earn your searches um, amongst a much uh, more diverse way of finding things. But you're absolutely right. You know, for me, the open and affordable web is a vital human tool. And we've seen how important it is to people in, in the uh, pandemic. And to keep it open and affordable, advertising has to work. So we've got a huge responsibility as the biggest player in the industry. You know, by the way, the advertising that people put with Google, when it's on YouTube or on a third party website, the majority of the revenue goes to the website. So, you know, advertisers are funding the free and open web, and that's really important. Um, we believe you can do that in a privacy safe way. And it's only by working together as an industry we can do that. That's what Privacy Sandbox is all about. Some of our technology, which is about allowing um, users to be reached by advertisers without violating any of their privacy. I believe that um, performance advertising and privacy can go hand in hand. You can do more with less data, but we can only do that by working together as an industry. Yeah, I mean, it's always interested me that Google is a good brand advertiser as well. You use yeah. advertising well, yeah. have major spend. Uh, and then, can I perhaps end by asking you about the metaverse? <clears throat> because one of the things that we were talking about in the Athens conference a couple of months ago is the amount of money that's being piled into the metaverse. Yeah. Um, and therefore it's going to work, and, and yeah. to which I remember asking, well, what about for people and have the lessons of Web 2.0 yeah. been learned and will the metaverse yeah. move us to a better place or is it too early? Where are you on that? Well, I firstly, I don't really know what it is, if I'm honest. And uh, I think there's a collection of really interesting technologies we should all be exploring, whether it's blockchain, Web 3, you know, VR, AR, whatever the metaverse, you know, uh, includes. But what I think is exciting is that shows the level of innovation. You know, the bets we're making on AI and machine learning are really paying off. I mentioned in the context of climate, but you know, at IO recently we talked about how Google Translate is going in leaps and bounds. That's about bridges, not walls between people. I'm personally rather more excited, not by the metaverse as a concept, which is sort of deep VR as far as I understand it, but by um, extended reality. Yep. Which is like, imagine a world that's annotated with all the world's information when you want it. So you could look at a plant and understand what it is. You can bring a dinosaur, and you can do this today, by the way, if you search Tyrannosaurus Rex, you can get a 3D dinosaur in your sitting room right in front of you. That kind of world is a wonderful world where you can make sense of it as you travel around. And I think that's something that excites us at Google because it links so much to our core mission of organizing the world's information and making it accessible and useful. Uh, and what is it that keeps you awake at night, if anything? You look like you slept very well today. Uh, I do my best. Um, I mean, I, I think there's never been a time, David, where technology could be more helpful to more people. And never been a time where technology's had a greater responsibility to do that well. And I think, you know, I feel that responsibility at Google every day. And I want to make sure we can put that te technology to work for good uh, in a time that's very, very uncertain. The, you know, the months and years ahead are very uncertain geopolitically, economically, what consumers are doing. And I think we've got a responsibility uh, to play our part there. Great, because I seem to remember stealing the line from the Avengers, with great power comes great responsibility. So it's nice to see you flexing it. And then, do you check every day what number one search is? I mean, out of, I'm curious here, what, what, people, what are people searching at the moment? What, do, um, what does the data tell you? No, no, but what, what actually, I was talking to my team about this, as we face into uncertainty, you know, Google Trends is an amazing tool, and I encourage anybody that's running a brand or a category to really look at what's happening in you know, their particular area. I want us to bring back something we did in the um, 2008 downturn, which was a barometer, to try to judge what's happening with consumer sentiment, because it's changing very fast. And I think increasingly those sort of real-time insights can really help with people, what's on people's mind. Right now, it's hard to make sense of the world, right? We, people are going on holidays, they booked two years ago, yeah. and they're desperate to get out there. But I think, you know, a cold winter is likely coming, and people will turn to us and others to find products and services at the right price and to you know, to find their way through the energy crisis and the cost of living squeeze. And we need to be there responsibly with them and, and with brands that can help them. And perhaps any final message for those that are watching this, Matt? Any, anything you'd like them to focus on? I mean, well, so first I'd say on behalf of Google, like, thank you for your patience with us. I really feel that you have um, challenged us, but made us better and also made us feel a part of the industry. And I hope that you feel that we're part of the industry. Absolutely. Um, so thank you for your patience with us. Um, and secondly, um, you know, we really want to work together to help you to transform your business, make it more sustainable, privacy safe, 
and more successful in uncertain times and we're here to help. Well, wonderful. And with that, from Ken, sadly we don't have a glass of rosé, but see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, David.